Hi, everybody, and welcome to tonight's uh, episode, I guess, of Big Ideas Live. We're going to be talking about what you can learn from a city neighborhood. Um, and I'm here tonight with Dr. Sandy Aketa from uh, SUNY Purchase College, where he's an associate professor of economics at the School of Natural and Social Sciences, which is a cool sounding place. Uh, so thanks All so right. much for being on tonight, Sandy. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this. So tell us a little bit about um, one of your favorite people. Yeah, oh, sure. Yeah, she's one of my heroes. Um, my other heroes, of course, are, are Ludwig von Mises, F.A. Hayek, um, Israel Kirzner. Um, but she really fits right in there because um, when I read her um, her first book, which is The Death and Life of Great American City, um, there was a resonance. Um, it was, uh, she was talking about uh, processes, social processes. She was talking about discovery. Um, in ways that were uh, at the same time familiar, but also um, a little bit different because she was reaching a lot of the same conclusions about the failure of central planning, um, this time at the local level, um, but uh, using uh, insights that were very similar to that of Mises and Hayek, for example, uh, the failure of planners to take into account local knowledge, she used the term locality knowledge, but really the same thing and how difficult it is, really impossible for them to acquire that knowledge uh, to the extent that would, um, uh, they would need in order to uh, plan uh, the kinds of cities that they wanted to. So she's, um, you know, arrives at a lot of uh, conclusions that were resonating with the kind of social theory that I was interested in. But um, Jacobs herself, if you want to know something about her, she's really interesting because uh, a lot of people, um, not only on the libertarian side, but also on the more leftist side, uh, are inspired by her um, because uh, I think she, uh, for a couple of reasons. One, I think, is because she um, was an activist. She mm -hmm. fought the kind of um, entrenched interest and uh, power elites in the uh, New York um, area uh, who wanted to, Robert Moses in particular, but others who wanted to sort of impose a vision um, without really on the city, without really understanding how the city works. Um, and so she, you know, got out on the street. She organized. She knew how to organize. She knew how to talk to people. Um, so that's part of it. I mean, she was sort of the, uh, part of that 1960s, late 1950s, early 1960s activism. Yeah. And she got in touch with a lot of the local activists. You know, most of whom were on the left. And she's very successful. But at the same time, um, she preached what she practiced. In other words, she's writing about what she's observing and doing. And the result of that was the life, uh, the death and life of great American cities, um, which, again, uh, cast suspicion on uh, central planning, um, on uh, heavy handed in intervention. Um, I mean, she was not a, a libertarian. But she was hitting on all these, you know, points that were uh, really important to people in the Austrian uh, tradition in economics and a lot of libertarians. Uh, so she appeals to both left and right. Um, she herself was not an academic. The growth of cities in the most dynamic part of cities tended to be on the outskirts, what we today call the, the, the suburbs, right? the mm -hmm. faubourg, the, the places where, strictly speaking, we're outside the control of the of the of the crafts uh, guilds and you know the, the the burgermeisters and everything, so people would settle kind of out, just outside that district where they could do their own thing, uh, and so you know we think of the suburbs today as being um, kind of the anti-city, uh, and you know we'll talk about that later. It's, when they're when they're artificially accelerated, their growth is, they can be, but historically you know the dynamism of cities have. have really come about as a result of development on the, that, the, the penumbra of cities, the, 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 out, the outskirts. For cities to be uh, incubators of ideas and, and sort of engines of economic development, uh, there have to be opportunities for people without a lot of money but with um, good ideas to, uh, to live um, in or near cities. And so, um, yeah, the high cost of living, high price of real estate um, is, is, is a problem. Now, um, in most cities, there are districts that are not uh, high price. These are places that may not have 
good transportation, they may have a bad reputation, uh, they may in fact be dangerous, um, or they may feel insecure. And that's where typically uh, people tend to move uh, who don't have much money. Um, you, know, the, you know, the Docklands in, in London, which are now you know, fabulously expensive, uh, were not so much like 20 years ago, 25 years mm -hmm. ago. Here in New York, uh, Williamsburg, right? Uh, I remember when I was a graduate student uh, many, many years ago looking for a place to live, I, I checked out Williamsburg and, and there was a, uh, and still is a very large Hasidic uh, Jewish community there and, and not much else. Uh, and now, as, uh, as you know, it's like the center of hipsterdom. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so things like that happen. Um, so, I mean, and New York is kind of a, a weird case because it really is difficult in the city to find affordable housing that's not, you know, subsidized by the government. Uh, strange enough, you can find um, housing that's subsidized privately um, uh, for, you know, uh, development. Um, but mm -hmm. um, that's a little bit rare. Uh, there are places in the outskirts, uh, Brownsville, um, in, in, in Brooklyn and elsewhere, in Queens and, and in um, the, you know, the Bronx, that, that are still relatively affordable. But yeah, no, that is. Now, the thing is, cities are not monolithic. I guess that's the point I'm trying to make, that, that, that there's some neighborhoods and districts that are economically vibrant, and therefore uh, you see the real estate prices rising in other places that aren't. Um, and so over time, you see this, this kind of shift from one um, to another, the prices rising and falling and then falling and then rising elsewhere. Emergent order is another uh, term that people like. And the technical definition is it's an order that comes about as a result of human action, but not as a result of human design. So a bunch of people um, are all going about their own business and a sort of order emerges. And for me, when I read Death and Life of Great American Cities, I had, it was just this amazing she didn't, uh, Jacobs didn't know what spontaneous order was. Um, she didn't use that word. No, and I, I don't think, she, well, maybe she had heard it, but she, she, did, she wasn't using that jargon, um, but that's what she was describing in the way that her neighborhood works. Um, right. So do you have anything that you want to say about spontaneous order that might be uh, useful to the people listening before we go forward? And then that we're going to jump right into talking about what makes a good city neighborhood work. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, an important concept. I think it holds the key to understanding a lot of, you know, about society, about the social order. Um, but I think what some people find confusing about it is um, that at some level, there's always some conscious planning. It's not spontaneous mm -hmm. uh, at some level of, of some social order. You know, if you take a, uh, if you take a city, for example, people always say, well, you know, it's, it's, it is a man-made creation because it, uh, you know, these buildings were, were designed by an architect and they were constructed according to fairly meticulous plans and, you know, it was uh, very well thought out. And, and so that's, that's certainly true. Uh, moreover, they'll point out that, well, there are highways, there are roads, you know, who will build the roads? Um, there's infrastructure there that um, is uh, definitely the result of somebody's overarching plan. That, that's undeniable. The question is whether uh, you can have a city, a vibrant city, without that kind of central planning from, you know, top down. Um, you know, that's one issue. I think uh, more um, germane would be to ask, you know, given, given we have some central planning, we have a, a, a government that governs these things, uh, to what extent uh, is that a help or a hindrance? I guess we'll talk about that in more detail later. But let me just say that even where the government, the local government plans an infrastructural thing, like uh, subways, for example, that over time is also a spontaneous order. Um, for example, when, when the first subways in New York were established in 1904, um, I don't think anyone could have foreseen exactly how it would have uh, not only developed, but how it would have affected the city. Um, I wrote about this in a column not too long ago, how um, the subways were an attempt to create urban sprawl. That is to say, the, the Lower East Side and places like that where there were working, working people, 
um, mm -hmm. tended to be very overcrowded. And one of the justifications for the subway at the time was to allow people to live outside the city and commute to the city. Right? So they wanted to subsidize suburbanization, or at least go out to the outer boroughs, you know, outer boroughs of Brooklyn, Queens, etc. And so the subways would go out to where people weren't. And it was, it was kind of like the interstate highway system, you know, in a small scale. You're, you're deliberately trying to, um, to lower the density of the cities. And um, what happened was then that the city built up around the transport hubs, right? built up around where the subways um, stopped. And the city infilled uh, to the point now where, you know, it's, the subway runs in, in some of the densest places uh, on earth, yeah. uh, or at least in the United States. Um, so, I mean, nobody predicted that would, well, no, somebody might have predicted it, but I don't think the planners were intending for that to happen when it was initially designed. So that's an example of a pattern that is a result of human action, but was not, uh, it's a stable pattern that, that nobody uh, had intended to create. What can we learn from a city neighborhood? Uh, this is the question um, that I've been so excited to ask. Uh, so first, let's talk about cities at their best. Uh, when you're walking around a neighborhood, and it's uh, a, you know the kind of neighborhood you want to walk around, it's vibrant, it's safe, there's a lot of stuff going on. People are, are generally pretty friendly, um, although people have different definitions of what that means. Like you said, some people don't <laughs> Not like being people. attacked could be friendly, yes. Right, right. Uh, so what can, we, what can we learn when we look around a neighborhood like that? Well, you know, the, the main indicator is, are there people around, right? That's the first thing. If there aren't, that's the first thing you notice, right? If you go out onto the street, say, you know, you, you land in, a, in an airport, you get in a taxi, you go to your hotel, um, and then, you know, you get unpacked and you go outside the door and you look around, there's nobody. Right? This, yeah. you're, you're, you're surrounded by tall buildings and, you know, uh, parking garages, uh, and, and, and things of that nature, and you walk, where the heck is everybody? That's, yeah. you, you notice that when a city or a neighborhood is not functioning, that there's, there just aren't many people. On the other hand, you know, if you leave your hotel and the people walking on the sidewalk, it's something you don't notice. Um, you kind of take for granted and you walk, okay, this, you just sort of feel, oh, well, the other people, and you kind of move around with the travel, you know, with, the, with the foot traffic. Uh, obviously, there's vehicular traffic too, but it's mainly the foot traffic that would attract you. And you think, okay, well, let's, let's let's see if I can find a restaurant okay, nearby, and you know where there are people on the street. Typically, there are restaurants that you can find that, that aren't too far away. Um, so, you know, that's that's probably the main indicator. Is you know, whenever it is you go out of the hotel, whether it's in the morning or afternoon or after dark, uh, there are people there. Um, so that gives you a sense of security and comfort that then uh, frees you to, to explore and to, to find um, kinds of uh, uh, alternatives or, or find things that you, you know, uh, might not have expected. Uh, I know this because I have some, not direct personal experience, but I know that this <laughs> sort of thing goes on, that you, you petition the zoning board for exceptions and things of that nature. But if you can think of zoning, you know, as it's supposed to be, uh, as it's supposed to be practiced, it's it's um, usually, as I said, it sort of excludes uh, uh, people or uses that you don't like. Poor people are attracted to cities. Right? You go to uh, any great city today or throughout history, there'd be a lot of poor people. Which is, you know, um, Ed Glazer, who published a book in 2012 called called The Triumph of the City, says that uh, this, that is actually a sign of success of the city, where you see poor people. Because that means, well, of a certain kind, that there, there are poor people without much money, immigrants maybe from outside the city, they could be from foreign countries too, who see opportunity in cities, and so they, they move there um, hoping to, to do better. Uh, Jacobs distinguishes between um, slumming and unslumming neighborhoods. That is, she says, not all slums are the same. Slums are basically where poor people live. Okay, they live in one place because the rents are cheap. But there are neighborhoods that are slums that are vibrant and that are on the way up. And then there are neighborhoods that are slums that, that are dying. And there are certain indicators you should, you know, she has a fairly specific indicators of which, you know, when you tell one from the other. 
But that's an important distinction to, 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 to make between not all, not all slums are the same. Um, now, why are some slums uh, persistent? Uh, by, by the way, you know, Harlem in its heyday was a slum, and it was one of the most creative uh, places uh, on earth uh, for a long time. Uh, maybe not so much anymore, but it's actually on its way back up. Um, so, you know, what happens is, you, you know, there's a com combination of, oh, all kinds of government interventions that contribute to this um, redistribution, uh, which, you know, I'm not saying, I'm not making any broad statement against redistribution or the welfare state right. and that thing here, but. A topic for another not, day. Let's, yeah, no, I mean, let's not, you know, fool ourselves that this has not had a disincentive effect um, or an incentive effect uh, on um, people not being able to, to uh, emerge from the slum. Uh, all kinds of public policies, uh, public schools, as opposed to private schools, um, you know, exacerbate the problem. I mean, if you look back in the history of cities, as I say, there have always been poor people, there have always been slums, but the sort of um, great society welfare programs, uh, subsidized housing, uh, other kinds of interventions with respect to wages and that kind of thing didn't exist. And, you know, uh, maybe that would have helped in some cases, but, you know, the New York uh, rose to be a great city without those things. Uh, New York yeah. probably is heyday. Uh, maybe it's golden age was um, 1930s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, okay. In terms of creativity, economic dynamism, it also reached the, the zenith of its population at that time. Uh, it's approaching that again. But anyway, I mean, this is before the Great Society programs. This is before massive ho housing projects. So that's something to consider. So what do you think can be done to help um, a a failed city, Detroit might be, we were talking about this, Detroit might be the only example of a whole city that's failed, but also neighborhoods that are having a really hard time. Do you think there's anything that pe can be done in terms of policy that we can uh, pursue? Um, we can make it easier to start a business there. Yep. Um, we can do things, at least in the short run, that would increase safety, which may involve police, but it could be something else as simple as, you know, adding, uh, you know, allowing businesses to come and so that there are more people on the street. I mean, again, I, I haven't studied it very closely. Yeah. I, I know in general what the problems are. Uh, but, you know, and it, so they're, you know, given the situation now, um, there are limited things one can do. Uh, um, what you don't want, but what you can do, do is sort of learn from Detroit. Um, okay. Because, as you say, there was a time when Detroit was was very vibrant. It was you know one of the great cities in, in the United States, you know, fueled by the automobile industry. Mm -hmm. And it's a very complicated, as all you know, urban problems are. It's a very complicated problem because um, Jacobs and others might point to the fact that it was a, a sort of a monoculture, a monoculture, a single industry dominating everything. There were a few other things we wanted to talk about. I'm going to try and make the resources available online. One of them is uh, Sandy has this great talk called A City Cannot Be a Work of Art, which is a really intriguing statement, I think. So I'll see if I can make something like that available through the website. Um, and the website, of course, is fee.org slash big ideas. It's on all of our graphics, so hopefully you've seen it by now. Um, Sandy has a column with the Freeman, which is uh, Fee's magazine, and it's called Wabi Sabi, which is, oh, remind me what it means. Um, the idea, it's a, it's a Zen Buddhist term that one, one interpretation is that you see the beauty in imperfection, in impermanence, um, and that sort of thing. And I, so I want to recommend it. It's uh, maybe my favorite column, uh, par only partly because he writes often about cities and I'm really enthusiastic oh, about them much. right now. Um, I will be sharing a few uh, columns from that. Uh, like us on Facebook so that you can keep up with us. Uh, like I said, I've been looking forward to this for a long time. I think it's been really great. Um, and I want to thank everybody for joining us as well. Yes, thank you, everybody. My pleasure. Janet, take care. You too. Bye, everyone.